Hi everyone, so uh, I guess we'll get started now that enough people have trickled in. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight for a discussion about the importance of comprehensive sexual health education. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, Haudenosaunee, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. My name is Pratika Chowdhury. I'm a research assistant for the BC Humanist Associ Association. Um, tonight's event is with Kristen Gilbert, the Education Director at Options for Sexual Health. She'll be speaking about the mandated curriculum for sexual health education in BC. Oh, sorry, just let someone in. Um, who delivers it? Who's missing out? Uh, who are the gatekeepers? And how can students and parents advocate for their right for comprehensive sex ed? For those of you who aren't familiar with humanism, it is a worldview that promotes dignity and autonomy. In 1973, the Second Humanist Manifesto stated that in the area of sexuality, we, we believe that intolerant attitudes, often cultivated by Orthodox religions and puritanical cultures, unduly repress sexual conduct, and that moral education for children and adults is an important way of drop, developing awareness and sexual maturity. Um, but before we begin, a few more housekeeping notes. First, your microphones have been muted out of respect for everyone listening in. I ask you to please keep them muted, except at the end when we'll have some time for questions. Second, please hold your questions until the end. Next, we will be recording tonight's talk and we will be sharing it on our YouTube channel and podcast. Um, and finally, as a small charity, we rely entirely on your donations to make this work and these events possible. If you're not a member yet, please sign, go to bchumanist.ca slash join to sign up or make a one-time or monthly donation at bchumanist.ca slash donate. Um, we recently developed, helped launch the Reproductive Justice Manifesto at reproductivejustice.ca and have launched a call for supportive, supporters of comprehensive sex ed on our website at bchumanist.ca. All those links can be accessed in the chat. And with that, I'll turn it over to our guest tonight. Thank you so much. What a really, really nice introduction. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, I feel really glad that we're going to be spending the next hour together talking about one of my favorite subjects, uh, which is comprehensive sexual health education. Uh, I am going to run a PowerPoint in the background because I know that there are some visual learners. Um, I won't be uh, watching the chat, but at the end of this presentation, which should last about 45 minutes, there'll be lots of time for questions, be they written questions or unmuted uh, through the microphone. So as I get started, the first thing that I want to do is I want to position uh, who I am and where I'm coming from. So I want to first acknowledge that I'm a settler on these lands and the lands that I'm on today are uh, the lands of the Coast Salish peoples, and in particular, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, these folks have stewarded these lands for time immemorial, and as a visitor on these lands, as someone who is a settler, an uninvited settler on these unceded territories, it's important for me and all of us to keep front of mind um, the impact that colonization has had on the Indigenous peoples. And in particular, I wanna reflect on the two spheres that I mostly work in, which is the spheres of education and healthcare, and how those two spheres have been responsible for so much uh, violence in the history with Indigenous peoples. Um, I wanna always keep that front of mind and always be available for more learning, deeper understanding, and please feel free to call me to task on those things. As I share in the background, uh, I want to show you a little bit of a visual of what it has meant to teach sex ed for the last two and a half years um, in BC. So this is a, <clears throat> a live photo of me teaching at the very beginning of the pandemic. So before I was able to set up, you know, a, a really good like document camera and ring light and all the things that I use now to teach sex ed online. This is literally me sitting on my at my dining room table. Uh, teaching sex ed online. It must have been a high school class because as you can see what I have on my table is uh, quite a lot of birth control. You can see some birth control pills there. You can see plan B or emergency contraception. You can see my most famous condom demonstrator, the golden woody that you see on the table there that was made for me by a previous student. Um, and, and 
And this is me at work. So who I am is I'm a sexual health educator. Um, I work for a nonprofit called Options for Sexual Health or Options for short. Uh, we're part of the Planned Parenthood International family. So we're the affiliate uh, here in the West Coast. Um, and we actually used to be called the Planned Parenthood Association of BC. And we've been around for more than 60 years uh, in service to British Columbians in supporting their sexual health and wellness. So where, uh, where I come in at Options is I'm a teacher. So I started with Options almost 20 years ago as a field educator, and now I direct the education department. I still do teach though. And at Options, we deliver sex ed in the schools, um, which is mainly what you and I are gonna be talking about tonight is school-based sexual health education, but it's broader than that. Uh, we teach not just in public schools, but in independent schools. We teach in alternative programs. We teach in youth in custody programs and also in other uh, school settings like colleges and universities. Um, I actually teach a 200 level course in human sexuality at UBC as well. We do a fair amount of training of professionals at Options as well, because as you'll see from this presentation, you know, we deserve support, those of us who are charged with delivering this information. And so we're the leaders in the teacher training for sexual health education as well. We even run our own certification program, which is called CHEC, or the Sexual Health Educator Certification Program. So with that in mind, tonight, what we're going to be talking about in a brief 45 minute presentation are these four things. I'm gonna define briefly for you what comprehensive sex ed is, um, what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like, and the effects of comprehensive sex ed uh, on learners. I also wanna talk specifically about the curriculum in British Columbia. Now I recognize that there's a, a range of curriculum that we see across Canada. Um, I'm only an expert in the curriculum in BC, but I do of course have some working knowledge of other curriculum and I have a bias, uh, a pro BC curriculum bias for reasons that I hope I'll be able to explain. Uh, I want to explore a little bit who the champions of sex ed are in the context of sex ed in British Columbia, and also who are the gatekeepers and what are the barriers, and finally, how can we eliminate those barriers, and how can we advocate for the rights of learners, the rights of students uh, to get comprehensive sexual health education uh, in our communities and in our families. So to begin, I wanna talk a little bit with what does it mean to say comprehensive sexual health education? I wanna define it really simply to start with and say comprehensive sex ed is essentially the opposite of abstinence only sexual health education. And so depending on where you yourself went to school, um, in what part of the world or in what part of the country you went to school, um, it's likely that you had less than comprehensive sex ed in your own educational history. Uh, that's the norm. And so what you see on the screen in front of you is a, a little bit of a more detailed exploration of what comprehensive sex ed is and what it means. And so I've drawn this information from this excellent document. I'm gonna stop sharing just briefly for a second. So this document called the Canadian Guidelines for Sexual Health Education, I'm gonna put a link to this document uh, in the chat so that you can download it yourself and have a look at it more than in detail. It's actually quite um, extraordinary. Um, and I want to acknowledge, first of all, that I was on the working group for this document. There we go. Um, and that it isn't binding. So these are ideals, ideals that uh, were created with a working group a couple of years ago. And CCAN, or the Sex Information and Education Council of Canada, was the main uh, author uh, and organizer of this document. So the Canadian guidelines take pains to explain what comprehensive sex ed means. And that's what I've based this uh, um, icon on. And so first of all, comprehensive sex ed is accessible to all types of learners. It's not just for students in school-based programs who are there every day and are able to um, uh, digest and comprehend and follow classic sort of stage on the stage on the stage education. It should be accessible to all types of learners from all perspectives. 
So not just different types of school, but also unschooling as well. It should be accessible to people who are not housed currently. It should be accessible to people of all genders, of all backgrounds, uh, with all types of resources people of all ages and all abilities, whether people are incarcerated or not, uh, whether people uh, are currently living with illness or not, or any type of a, of a learning disability. Comprehensive sex ed should be accessible to all. And so when we're talking about comprehensive sex ed today, we'll mainly be talking about sex ed in the schools because that's the main way that sex ed is distributed. But in order to be truly comprehensive, it should be available to all types of learners. Comprehensive sex ed should celebrate and promote human rights. I want you to know that that's definitely the perspective that we come from at Options for Sexual Health. And for a little bit more information about us organizationally and maybe the services that we offer, I'm also going to pop into the chat right now a link to our website at Options. So we definitely come from a rights-based lens when we teach sex ed in the schools at Options. And so the, the knowledge of people's human rights and the celebration of human rights is key in comprehensive sex ed. And one example that I want to give you that's hopefully a little bit controversial is I want to talk about that people have the right to be sexual beings, including young people. For example, when we talk about consent, and we talk about age of consent, we often talk about age of consent from the perspective of people need to be this age in order to be allowed to participate in sexual activities. And that's a, a welcome and important lens. But let's also include the lens that people have the right to be sexual, including young people. So comprehensive sex ed includes rights in its perspectives and viewpoints. Comprehensive sex ed is correct. It's scientifically accurate and it's uh, responsive to new scientific information. And so certainly any sex ed that you right now might have gotten when you were younger, things are different. Things have changed. We know more. And so we wouldn't deliver sex ed the way that we used to 10 15 or even five or two years ago, we want to be sure that the material that learners are getting is correct and scientifically sound. It should also be broad in scope. And what we mean by that is it's not just about, for example, how to put a condom on. It's not just about how to avoid sexually transmitted infections. It's not just about how old people need to be before they can consent to sex. It's also about pleasure and identity and about uh, communities. It should be broadly based in its topics, not narrow in what we discuss. Comprehensive sex ed by definition must be inclusive, inclusive of all types of expressions, all genders, all types of attractions, including asexuality. It should be inclusive and responsive to different cultural perspectives, even different faith perspectives. It should be thoughtful to the community where it's being presented and should be uh, culturally responsive as well. Comprehensive sex ed should keep gender and gender equality in mind. We should consider gender-based violence when we're talking about comprehensive sex ed. We should consider uh, sexualized violence when we consider uh, delivering comprehensive sex ed. But we should also balance the positives with the negatives. So often comprehensive sex ed is taught from a, like a, a, a unwanted outcomes perspective, uh, that we're always trying to avoid unplanned pregnancies or avoid STIs or avoid people becoming sexually active at an early age. And while those perspectives are sound and should be part of teaching, we also want to include how human sexual expression enriches our lives. The positives of sexual expression should be part of comprehensive sex ed. It should be up to date and responsive. As things happen in the world, as we discover new ideas, these should be included 
in comprehensive sex ed. For example, uh, all of the risk to access to reproductive and sexual health care that's happening um, in the world today, but particularly south of the border right now, that should inform the way that we teach and talk about sex ed in the classrooms. The people who deliver sex ed should be well-trained and knowledgeable and be supported as they teach sex ed. All of these things, all of these things create thoughtful, comprehensive, responsive sexual health education, which should be by definition very different from what you and I received in school. And I'm sorry to say what a lot of people are receiving today and these days. So I just wanna add a little bit of extra to this definition. So a, a companion to the guidelines for sexual health education is an excellent document called Questions and Answers, Sexual Health Education in Schools and Other Settings, also created by CCAN, um, uh, also something that I was involved in the uh, writing of. And so I'm also gonna put a link to that in the chat if you're interested in exploring that more. And from this Q&A document came this excellent quote, that the Canadian guidelines are based on an individual's right to make informed choices based on information, and that this is consistent, this approach, and aligned with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which articulates all Canadians' rights to personal liberty and security of person, as well as freedom of thought, belief, and opinions. Sex ed is a rights issue. And I want to be sure that we're seeing it from that perspective. I want to talk a little bit about the different ways that people learn about sex in the world. There are a lot of ways that we could approach this, but I want to, I want to talk to you about how things are done in the Netherlands, how things are done in the United States, and contrast those with the way things are done here in Canada. So I want to draw your attention to an amazing researcher's work, Amy Shalit. So if you're an academic, maybe this reference that I have on the screen for you right now might be interesting and helpful for you. But I'm also going to drop in the chat Amy Shalit's website in general so that you can have a look at her work, as well as an amazing book that she wrote. I actually have right here called Not Under My Roof, where she talked about this study that she did with Dutch and American parents. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment just to grab your attention. And so years ago, I made up a fake <laughs> three-point scale of how cool different peoples are in the world about sex stuff. <laughs> I want to emphasize that I made this up. This isn't research-based. This is me, Kristen, trying to explain and visualize the differences of the way people feel and talk about sexuality in the world. And I wanna contrast three uh, places, the Netherlands, Canada, and the United States. So in her research, Amy Shalit asked parents, how would you feel if your teenage child brought their partner, their girlfriend or their boyfriend or their partner home for a sleepover tonight at your place. And so this book, Not Under My Roof, is about the responses that she got and uh, what she believes influences those, influence those responses. If you're Dutch, you might not be surprised to hear this, that in the Netherlands, parents were a little bit confused by the question, frankly. Um, they said things to Amy like, um, what do you mean? Like, do we have room at home for an extra person? Do we have an extra pillow? <laughs> Will we feed them breakfast in the morning? It was a little bit of a confusing question for them because as part of the culture of sexuality in the Netherlands, there's a lot of comfort and a lot of discussions in family units when it comes to sexuality. And so it's normalized in Dutch culture to talk about sex, to talk about decision-making, to talk about feelings. Mm -hmm. And so because those things are normalized, parents and caregivers in the Netherlands feel connected, feel knowledgeable, feel pretty sure about how their young people are doing and what decisions they're making. 
And so there was no presumption that a sleepover meant that their child would be sexually active with their partner if they slept over. And for the most part, those parents were right. Because it turns out that in a culture or a community where sexuality is talked about frequently with comfort and with ease and with honesty, that in a community or a culture or a country like that, young people tend to wait before they become sexually active until they feel a feeling of readiness. And also young people identified that they felt truly connected to that partner that they might share sexual experiences with. Sometimes love, sometimes um, a period of time had elapsed where they feel ready and comfortable with that person. That feeling of readiness and that feeling of connection to their partner ranked the highest in how they made decisions about whether or not they became sexually active. You know, when you and I were young, <laughs> we often refer to that as losing our virginity. And I want you to know that that's not current practice. We don't use that expression anymore for good reason. First of all, because it seems to be tied to this idea that some bodies, particularly bodies with vaginas, have like a, like a barrier, a barrier. Uh, we, we might've called that like a hymen. Um, I call it the magic penis shield. Right? It's this idea that there's this body part, this magical body part that we're given that determines whether or not we're a certain type of person. And, and, and I want you to know that that body part, we've assigned meaning to it, assigned meaning to it, which isn't biological in nature. That's not what a hymen is designed or meant to do. It's frankly a vestige, a leftover body part from the formation of the opening of the vagina. It doesn't have meaning. And after infancy, it also doesn't have purpose. But we've assigned incredible meaning to that body part um, to the detriment of a lot of people's rights and decision-making abilities in the world. And so these days, we aren't talking about a loss of virginity. We're more thinking about that decision as an opportunity for exploration that people can make decisions about, that people have the right to make decisions about. And so a better term than losing your virginity is, are you ready? One's sexual debut. Isn't that lovely? I don't know when I said that, if you heard a little flourish, a little do 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 in your mind, like, isn't that so positive, a sexual debut? What's also so wonderful about a sexual debut is it isn't based on a particular sex act. It isn't based specifically on a penis going in a vagina, for example, because of course you and I know that there are lots of types of sexual uh, activities which are significant for people. And so a sexual debut is self-defined. It's that person's individual determination of their most significant first sexual experience. And it might very well be penis vagina sex, but it could be another sex act. And I also wanna say, that back when we used to define this as a loss of virginity, that an act of sexualized violence, sexual assault, for example, might be counted as the loss of virginity. And I want to acknowledge that a sexual debut is self-defined, that someone gets to decide for themselves when they've consented or had that experience. And so all this to say, that interestingly in the Netherlands, young people tend to have their sexual debut later in life than we might expect. They're waiting for that feeling of readiness. They're feeling supported by their family members and they're waiting for a feeling of connection with their partner that they have their debut with. Not exclusively, not 100%, but that defines the experience differently than it does in other places. So when Amy Shalit asked that question of American parents, how would you feel if your teenager brought their partner over for a sleepover tonight? You know that that's where she got the title of this book, Not Under My Roof. That was generally the response that American parents had, which was, no, that's not allowed. I don't wanna be seen as encouraging sexual activity, but there was also something in common with those households. There was a lack of discussion about sexuality, a lack of comfort and connection with talking about that, a lack of comprehensive sex ed in the schools, and two more things. 
One was the young people in the United States who didn't get comprehensive sex ed, who didn't get to talk to their family members about sexuality, they were more waiting for an opportunity to become sexually active rather than waiting for a feeling of readiness. And what I mean by that is things like, well, it's prom night. Everybody has sex on prom night. Or we've been dating for this amount of time. I guess we'll have sex now. Or everybody in grade whatever is sexually active. Everybody knows that. I guess I better do that. Those feelings of opportunities. Oh, my parents are away for the weekend. Or I'm out without supervision. Now's my opportunity to have my sexual debut, right? So quite a contrast of experiences. So I told you it was a fake three-point scale, right? So at the top of the scale, the people in the world who seem to have the most ease and facility with talking about sexuality, the most comfort, as well as the best outcomes, that's in the Netherlands. All the way down at the bottom of my made-up scale, <laughs> the people who have very low comfort with talking about sex ed, little comprehensive sex ed in the schools, and where people have a younger age of sexual debut is in the United States. Now, where are we in Canada and British Columbia? Well, we're right here. Uh, I don't know. I don't think we'll ever be as cool as they are in the Netherlands. I don't think that's going to happen. If you know any Dutch people, you should date them, my friends. They're probably pretty great people to date. But, but, but here's some comfort. We'll always be cooler than Americans when it comes to sex stuff, you and me, right? We've got more access to information, more comfort, more ease, and more resources. And so with that in mind, I want to talk a little bit about what we know what we know from data about youth in BC. So this is a quick screen cap of some data from the Adolescent Health Survey. I hope that you're familiar with the Adolescent Health Survey. If you're not, you're about to get an earful about it because it's amazing data, folks. The Adolescent Health Survey has been going on for more than 35 years in British Columbia. Every five years, Tens of thousands of grades 7 through 12 BC students are surveyed about their health. Lots of general health questions like, uh, what did you have for breakfast today? How many hours did you sleep last night? How many people are in your family? Tell us about um, whether or not you vape. Like those, those kinds of health questions. But they also ask some questions about sexuality. And so we've got longitudinal data about young people and sexual decision making in BC. This is the best data available in Canada, I would argue in the world, to be honest. And so we know exactly what's happening with young people and their beliefs and attitudes about sexuality. And so the screen that I'm showing you right now, this is from the 2008 Adolescent Health Survey. Um, so that was a few surveys ago. I'm excited that next year, 2023, is another Adolescent Health Survey year. And I've begged McCreary to include this question in again, just so we can see how things compare. So when asked, when asked, are you sexually active in British Columbia? I want you to know, listen to this, 80%. 80% of BC high school students have never been sexually active with a partner before. 80%. That's enormously high and probably quite different from what you've heard or what you've imagined and also quite different from what BC youth have heard about themselves. 20% of BC high school students surveyed five years ago in 2018 20% have uh, had intercourse before. And so 80% have not. Now, of the group who have not been sexually active before, in 2008, they asked, what's your reason for not having had intercourse before? And here are the reasons in front of you. Now, these reasons add up to far more than 100 because there were multiple answers, but let's have a look at the trends. Overall, the number one answer for why a student is not yet sexually active is they were not ready, not ready to be sexually active, which in terms of outcomes is exactly what we're looking for, right? The number two overall answer was I'm waiting to meet the right person to become sexually active with. Also an excellent answer and something that should give us um, confidence in sex ed that's happening in BC over the last little while. There were some differences in the genders in the answers. 
uh, you'll notice that uh, for this slide, the answers were divided into a binary into males and females. Uh, that's because responses from folks who identified as something other than male or female in the survey uh, were not statistically significant, so not included on this slide, right? I hope that uh, those answers will grow over time uh, as more and more young people identify uh, outside of the binary of the genders. Um, you'll see that uh, respondents who identified as female were much more concerned with things like avoiding pregnancy and avoiding STIs and about disapproval from friends than males were. So certainly this slide isn't only great news, isn't only positives. We can also see things here that we can really uh, focus on and improve on when it comes to sex ed, but we should really be encouraged by how young people are making decisions about becoming sexually active based on their internal feeling of readiness and also about their connection with their partner or their potential partner. And so in BC, what are young people, what are students getting? I wanna tell you about the curriculum, but before I do that, I wanna tell you a little bit of a story about why we are where we are today. First of all, I identified my bias early that I teach in BC. And I, I honestly think that in BC, when we compare it to other curriculums across country that ours arguably, I think, is the most comprehensive and frankly, the best. Um, it's written differently from other curriculum. In Ontario, for example, it's very, very specific. Teach this specific topic at this specific grade level. Um, in BC, we're a little bit more general. And you'll see that when I show you the, the slides that are coming up. As someone who's an experienced sexual health educator, there is a lot of latitude and freedom that I can use in the general learning outcomes that we see here in BC. But I also want to acknowledge that for inexperienced educators, which frankly most teachers are when it comes to sex ed, that the generalities that are in our curriculum um, can be daunting. And so I want to say that. I also want to acknowledge that we've had comprehensive sex ed in British Columbia for a generation now. You might know that, or you might be surprised to know that. If you went to school in BC, maybe you're saying to yourself, I definitely didn't get comprehensive sex ed. If you're currently parenting students who are in the BC system, you might be saying to yourself, I know my kid isn't getting comprehensive sex ed, how come? So I want to tell you what the curriculum says students should be receiving, and then reflect a little bit on the gaps um, as I see them these days. So sex ed starts in kindergarten, friends. It starts in kindergarten with some basics that are age appropriate. So first of all, young people beginning in kindergarten have the right to know about the names of their body parts. Now I've put a little portion of this in quotes because um, I take issue with the way that it's written in the curriculum. In the curriculum, it says that students are to learn all the parts of their bodies, including the so-called male and female private parts. Now that is some kind of garbage right there. First of all, I want you to know that no well-trained and experienced educator is gonna divide the parts into male and female. Uh, we have a much more inclusive way of talking about body parts in the classrooms these days. And also I wanna assure you that we don't call them the private parts. We certainly talk about them, acknowledging that they're private, you know, genitals are called genitals. Nipples are called nipples, right? We don't call them the so-called private parts, right? Um, that's like calling them the place which shall not be named. Um, and that's not sex positive, comprehensive sex ed. And so it's quite joyous to talk about the names of body parts with young people. I often say this, that one of the most fun parts of my job is listening to kindergarten kids say things like testicles. <laughs> it's pretty great, pretty fun. Um, and celebratory. And so we learn about all the names of the body parts, elbows, eyes, noses, nipples, bottoms, penises, vulvas. We learn about all of them and all bodies learn about all the names of all body parts, right? We certainly don't divide classrooms um, into two groups, right? And only teach some things to some learners, right? Also, we talk about types of touching. We talk about ways of being touched that are enriching in our lives, types of touch that make us feel safe and loved and that we agree to. And we also talk about types of touch that can be confusing 
or upsetting or make us feel worried or hurt or types of touch that we don't agree to. And so this, of course, is sexual abuse prevention. And I want to flag for you, um, especially if you have uh, kids that are in kindergarten through grade three, that in my experience as an educator, that schools will often cover that second learning outcome without covering the first learning outcome. And um, I want to say that that's not the way that it should be. We should celebrate the beauty and wonders of our bodies as well as giving people information that can keep them safe and connecting them to resources, right? All of those things are part of the curriculum. And newish in the curriculum is this outcome that says factors that influence self-identity or who am I in the world. Exploring that in kindergarten through grade three is also joyous. We mostly talk about the range of types of families that there are in the world and what does it mean to be me? And so that's the K-3 curriculum as it relates to human sexuality. Um, I teach K-12. through I'm really, really lucky. But if I, I don't know, win the lottery this week and uh, I get to decide, you know, what I want to teach exclusively for the rest of my career, it would be grade four, <laughs> grade four and grade five. It's so wonderful. That's when we start talking about puberty changes in school. Um, and in my experience as an educator, talking about puberty changes with people before they experience those puberty changes is really, really wonderful. It's also best practices. So grade four and five students think I'm a fairy. <laughs> they love talking about sex ed in grade four and grade five. It's really, really fun. It's really different from the way that you and I probably experienced it. We don't divide classes into two. We talk about all experiences and all bodies, and we really build empathy as we talk about the puberty changes that are coming up ahead, which in grade four and grade five tend to sound really wonderful and exciting. It also gives people a sense of what to expect and supports trans and non-binary students, particularly because puberty changes can be very, very difficult for trans and non-binary folks. And so we're giving them lots of resources ahead of time, as well as all of the cis folks um, as they go through their expected puberty changes. Do you know that it doesn't appear in the curriculum how to make a baby until grade six in the BC curriculum? You'll probably agree with me that that's far too late. I really don't love this. I don't love that sometimes I'll explain how reproduction happens in grade six and I can see that there are some students in the class that are learning about it for the first time. That's not ideal. It's ideal that we learn about human reproduction from the people who know us best and care most about us and much, much younger than grade six. It's absolutely developmentally appropriate for a small child to know how babies are made. There are absolutely age appropriate ways of discussing that. Um, and I hope if you're raising children that you'll take advantage of that and make sure that you deliver this information before grade six. Uh, and hopefully it will be a review for them when I meet them. Strangely, we start talking about sexually transmitted infections also in grade six, which also doesn't make me happy as an educator. Uh, this is a leftover, a bit of a hangover from the HIV and AIDS epidemic of the late 80s and early 90s. Um, back then, uh, sex ed was hastily put back in the school system to keep people safe. And so talking about HIV and AIDS in grade six or grade seven might have made sense in the late 80s, early 90s. But these days, um, you know, we talk about STIs a lot in secondary school. There's really no developmental reason why we would need to talk about the hazards of sexual activity in grade six and grade seven, just as people are learning about it for the first time. But I do take advantage of this in the sense that I talk about HPV in the classrooms, since the HPV vaccine is offered in the school systems in grade six. In secondary schools, specifically grades eight, nine, and 10, we have very, very comprehensive learning outcomes to cover when it comes to sex ed. So this is an example of the broad categories that we have in BC. Healthy sexual decision-making, for example. Oh my gosh, I could do, I don't know, a dozen learning uh, like lesson plans based on that alone. Healthy sexual decision-making is certainly about things like consent. It's about knowing about community resources. It's about how to make a healthy relationship. It's about um, who am I in the world and what values are important to me. It's also about 
knowing how to keep the sperm and the egg apart if that's a concern, avoiding unplanned pregnancies, um, avoiding sexually transmitted infections, but also getting them treated when that happens. It's so complex, sexual decision making, right? Oh, it's about sex and the law, right? So there's a lot that we can cover. Sources of health information are super important for young people, especially, especially um, in the internet age, uh, knowing where to find uh, correct, up-to-date information rather than just Googling and getting the first hit. Healthy relationships is a broad category, but that's included in sexual health education. You'll notice at the top it says grade 8 and 10, 8, 9, and 10, and that's because in British Columbia currently, sex ed is housed in what we call the health and education classes. That's only mandated kindergarten through grade 10 in British Columbia. And so theoretically, sex ed might end after grade 10 in BC. And I'm sure we could agree that's far from ideal. So I've dropped the link to the curricular documents in the uh, uh, chat if you'd like to have a look at them in detail. Um, also, I forgot to include a link to the Adolescent Health Survey. If I made you uh, interested in that material, here's the latest Adolescent Health Survey in the chat as well. And so how does it actually look in BC? Well, first of all, I want to say that there's great sex ed going on in a lot of classrooms in a lot of places. Um, my overarching comment is that sex ed in BC is good to excellent, but there are a lot of things that we could improve on. We found in a survey that we did at Options a number of years ago that sex ed is delivered, we called it hit or miss, meaning you could walk into a random classroom and maybe those students had had comprehensive sex ed, but that probably they got a bit of a scattershot access to sex ed, depending on what teachers they had and what school boards they were in. It's not unusual for me to teach a grade six class, for example, and most of those students are getting sex ed for the first time in my classroom. So they've missed the K to five education, but are thankfully getting the grade six education. Also, what we notice is that when sex ed is delivered, it's almost always from this deficit position of wanting to avoid unwanted outcomes, like, I don't know, um, an early sexual debut, or um, unplanned pregnancies, or STIs, or broken hearts, right, uh, rather than focusing on the successes, and on the positives, and the beauty of sexual expression. Teachers in British Columbia are not trained in their pre-service learning to teach sex ed. So when teachers are trained in a university program, there is no course in teaching sex ed. Occasionally, occasionally I'm brought in for a quick workshop for teachers in training, but that's the exception and not the rule. We do deliver quite a lot of professional development or pro-D uh, here at Options for Sexual Health, um, but a lot of teachers have never had any training or support in the delivery of sex ed. And so, as you can imagine, if we don't feel comfortable, knowledgeable, or supported in teaching sex ed, we're unlikely to deliver it. And I also want to highlight that there is no accountability for this in our province. There is no one holding school boards or teachers or principals to task in delivering this, and yet it is mandated. So the BC Ministry of Education does mandate that all students are to receive sex ed in British Columbia, all students, but there's no one checking to make sure that that happens. Um, and if I were to have a question for the ministry, it would be, how come? And how can that change? So who wants comprehensive sex ed? We're really clear on this, mostly thanks to CCAN, the Sex Information and Education Council of Canada. You may have heard that parents resist the delivery of sex ed. And I want you to know that data doesn't show that to be true. Surveys don't show that to be a true reflection of how parents and caregivers feel. In fact, when surveyed, parents consistently say that they want sex ed in schools. Just a brief snapshot, for example, this survey from 2020 
um, asking if sexual health education should be provided in schools. In British Columbia, 90% of parents and care caregivers said yes. Overwhelmingly, from north to south, from west to east, parents and caregivers want sex ed in the schools. And it's not just parents who want sex ed, but it's the students as well. Overwhelmingly, when surveyed in the BC Adolescent Health Survey, but also other comprehensive surveys, students say they're not getting the sex ed that they want or need. And another group that advocates often for better, most comprehensive sex ed is marginalized folks. Folks who say, I deserve to be seen. I deserve to be understood. I deserve my rights to be held in high regard. Marginalized folks are frequently asking for, demanding, requesting, begging for comprehensive sex ed in the schools. I wanna highlight a couple of folks who are doing that. I'm gonna put three links in the chat right now. A group of young people led mostly by um, YouthCo here in British Columbia um, has a campaign called Sex, is Our, Sex Ed is Our Right. I also wanna highlight the Native Youth Sexual Health Network or Nishan, including the Coast Salish team here on the West Coast. And I wanna uh, mention Chimamuk, uh, which is housed with the BC Center for Disease Control, but is offering um, uh, uh, culturally competent sex ed to uh, by Indigenous folks for Indigenous folks. And so as I wrap up, I wanna talk about who are the gatekeepers? What is preventing comprehensive sex ed from happening every day in our classrooms? If it's not parents, if it's not students, if it's not marginalized folks, who are the gatekeepers? Friends, it tends to be school boards. It tends to be school boards who don't make sure that this is delivered in their classrooms. I wanna highlight the Vancouver School Board here as a leader in this. The Vancouver School Board has a standalone policy, board passed, about the delivery of sexual health education in their schools. And so their leaders and other school boards could follow suit. In an individual school, an individual principal will be supportive or not supportive of their teachers delivering this mandated material? Are they making sure that their teachers feel supported? Are they making sure that their teachers are getting pro-D? Are they supporting their teachers when their teachers deliver this if there's any resistance from families or communities? And I do see a lot of resistance and gatekeeping done by teachers, but I just wanna say that teachers want to teach. Teachers deserve support and training. And teachers deserve to know that we have their back, that when they deliver this mandated material, that we will support them, right? Families and communities are can be quite loud in their resistance to comprehensive sex ed, but I want to reiterate that though those voices can be loud, that overwhelmingly parents and caregivers support comprehensive sex ed in the schools. And finally, what can we do to support the comprehensive sex ed that we all desire? Supporting young people as they advocate for this is, I would say, our best distribution of power, making sure that young people are at the forefront of this work. Join advocacy efforts that are already in place likely run by young people, but that are also well-designed. Let's not reinvent the wheel every time we want to advocate for sex ed. If you are in the position to do this, demand that the sex ed in your schools happen. You know, my child now is 20 and in university, but when she was in school, even though I'm a sex educator myself, I had to call her school every year for several years and remind them that I knew that sex ed was in the curriculum and that I was holding them to task to deliver it. I wasn't worried about my own kid's knowledge base. You probably feel bad for her that her mom's a sex educator. She obviously knows things, but I was concerned about her peer group, making sure that they got the education that they deserved. And finally, I wanna say something that's maybe a little bit controversial, which is if you have kids in the school system, resist, taking care of this with your own money. Resist funding this yourself. Resist hiring a guest. Resist 
having the pack hire a guest. This is part of general education in BC. It should be funded by the general fund. Teachers should be trained and students should receive this information. It should not be PAC funded or parent funded or certainly not permanently funded that way. I would support PAC funded sex ed in order to change the tide of sex education, but it should be funded by the general education funding because it's just part of the education that all students deserve. I want to say that sex ed isn't just about like learning about the so-called birds and the bees, right? It's, it's about developing comfort and celebrating self. It's about creating intimacy, connection, resources. It's about growing stronger communities. Advocating for comprehensive sex ed has a ripple effect that cannot be measured. And I really want to thank you for your advocacy and your attention to this. I want to be sure that you know that we have a phone number that you can call. It's our sex ed sign. Uh, I'll leave this phone number up on the screen for a little while. Feel free to give us a call if you have questions about resources um, and uh, if you have questions about sex because you've got lousy sex ed yourself. I haven't left much time for questions, but I hope that you have some questions or some comments that we can discuss in the couple of minutes that we have left. Thank you so much for your attention tonight, folks. I really, really appreciate it.